Um, this is Dark Magazine. I'm your host, Nalini Haynes. Today's guest hails from Mad Max land. He's designed ads for phone sex lines, written for a church newspaper, and drawn a few comics for David Lee Roth of Van Halen fame. Jump! My guest, Garth Jones, finds inspiration in rock and roll fantasists and occult piss takers, iconoclasts and the wildly self-indulgent. And now Jones has his own book, Home Brewed Vampire Bullets, drawing on all the above. Welcome, Garth Jones. Hi, Nalini. Uh, sorry for putting you through that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> well, just before we get on to the, the really important stuff, I just want to say that um, I realise I'm going to have to declare... This podcast will be on both uh, YouTube and as a podcast. For those people who actually want to see it, head on over to YouTube or look at my website because it'll be there um, because there'll be some visuals, visual stuff. <laughs> YouTube will make me uh, declare this as a paid promotion. Now, that doesn't mean I'm getting any money. I'm actually not getting any money. What it means is that I have this bag of goodies that um, are actually the reason that uh, inspired me to actually do a video today. Um, and so I have to declare it as a paid promotion, even though it didn't include any cash, oh, I mean, swear. None, none at all. <laughs> um, anyway, the first thing and the most important thing and the reason for this interview is your new book, Homebrewed Vampire Bullets. So would you like to tell us all about it? Uh, well, this project had been gestating since, I guess, 2008 maybe. Um, I'd been working in advertising and, you know, the, the image of advertising back in the day <clears throat> uh, or the, that sort of era uh, was slowly becoming a bit more cleansed after a decades of naughtiness, I guess. And I'd sort of decided to start working on a semi-autobiographical novel, uh, but the voice was just terrible, like such a wanker. Every, yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> shocking, yeah, shockingly bad. Uh, and then flash forward to 2015, uh, I got a little bit more confident with like, well, I, I trained as an illustrator and graphic designer, so my... I, I'd always written and, you know, been a fan of uh, writing, but, yeah, the long quest to find a voice sort of culminated with a few competitions in 2016 that led me to believe I could actually do it, uh, because, you know, being a bit lazy about it, but I uh, got uh, the ultimate inspiration to get going when uh, we uh, found out we were pregnant with our daughter in 2018 and I gave myself the deadline of finishing the first manuscript. Um, so yeah, it yeah, this thing combines all of my interests and, you know, themes from growing up in the middle of the desert, um, pre-internet, what's more, uh, cultural, not backwater, but definitely cut off from things that weren't cars, brew shooters, uh, <laughs> CDs that were 15 years out of date <laughs> that would have that you'd think were brand new because you had no exposure to popular culture whatsoever. Uh, having two TV stations. Oh, uh, so those <laughs> were the days. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that Star Wars came out in 1987 because that's the first time it was shown on TV. Uh, oh really? Oh yeah. Oh no! All the ads, the ads were on in the 70s. Yeah, videoing, yeah, videoing things, taping the, doing the mixtape off the radio every Friday night. Uh, and it just, yeah, really indulging, I guess, an obsession with just world building. And because the book is graphic in the visual sense as well, uh, I enjoy spending a lot of time on the sort of details and sort of building things up into like a richer universe, as it were. This ties together basically my 15 years in Melbourne after leaving Broken Hill. <laughs> And all the all the bands, all the share houses, all the lost long weekends, all the, and then and then sort of yeah starts to weave in my interest in politics and religious bureaucracy and all sorts of other things that I've been exposed to too. So basically, you're saying it's he died with a falafel in his hand, combined with everything that Max Barry's written regarding corporate culture. This is uh, a religious bureaucracy, but yeah, yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
and the organisation I've worked for um, it was actually reflected in this novel, obviously. <laughs> okay, right. Now I have to confess to, re- to listeners that um, I haven't actually read this book. I usually read as much as I can before I interview somebody, but... Um, if you've been following my website and my online, you know, my socials, you'll know that I've been really sick. So this actually marks my recovery. I'm close, cl- much closer to normal at the moment. Well, that's but, good to hear. <laughs> uh, thank you. But I haven't actually managed to read this because I'm desperately trying to catch up. Of course. There's an audio excerpt on my website uh, read, read by the comedian Justin Hamilton, who I did podcast with as well. So you can get a snippet there if you want to have a <laughs> quick look. And I um, believe I follow him on Twitter too, yes. so he's <laughs> worthwhile. Now, I got this this bag a little while ago, um, which was a little bit of a surprise. Anthony, your publicist, had contacted me on Twitter and asked me for my address. So mm. I, got the, I was expecting a book. I didn't expect Bling to go with the book. Um, Swag in the in the industry parlance, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I um, I op- I confess I opened it up already. And then I decided I'd do an unboxing, and I haven't because I went back in the hospital. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's been quite the journey. Oh, but anyway, so this this is effectively my unboxing. Now I'm hoping you can see this. <laughs> it's a guitar pick. Now, my, my son actually happens to be a guitarist, so I'm going to send Hand this Hand it to over, him. for sure. That's going to a proper, it's a proper destination. Yep. <laughs> yes, he, he has several guitars these days. Um, so that, that's interesting. And another thing Paper. that my son <laughs> might be interested in is a bottle cap. <laughs> I just... Now, this bottle cap has a little bit of a story attached to it now because I swear to you, it was in this bag in the drawer underneath my TV. And then earlier this week, I went to Brew Bar where I have my coffee and it was in my handbag. Like, how did that happen? What? <laughs> I've got, there's a, a thread in the novel is, um, do you remember Peter Brock's Orgone um, energy polarizer that he had? Uh, his, he had a special edition Commodore in the 1980s. Well, he was a racing car driver, wasn't he? He was a racing car driver, yeah. yeah. In the, I guess, in the seventies and eighties, and he made a Back comeback the towards the end of it. Yeah, yeah. And he had a, uh, he got interested in orgone crystals. Yeah. Which are like a pseudo scientific, I guess, power source, which is basically just a bunch of crystals stuck into like a little box that he attached to a car, and said so it enhanced the performance of the car. So that's a, a plot thread in the book, and maybe there's some orgone related stuff happening with the, the bottle cap. Sorry, I never heard this before about Peter Brock and I never heard anybody doing that to a car before. He just put a little box of crystals underneath the, under the chassis and they had the Peter Brock special editions (laughs) and he was convinced that it enhanced the performance of the car. Okay, right, well. Look it up, guys. (laughs) I, I believe you. Um, and uh, there's also a, a sticker that um, once upon a time your mum called them bumper stickers, but these days I think they're more like laptop stickers. That's the cover your Mac logo. <laughs> yes. Um, and. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now, I personally don't drink beer. Well, not that type anyway, but I have oh, a bottle go. of ginger beer. Excellent. So, um, Brilliant. Here we go. <laughs> so I, had, I was. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of time on my hands. We were um, hanging out in New Zealand after the floods in Queensland and uh, my Friday nights were coming up with merch ideas, uh, some of which made it over the line budgetarily and some of which didn't. Uh, these are the ones that made it. There's actually a uh, beer coaster too. Oh, wow. But that got lost in the mail for about, yeah, I only received them recently because uh, they were things, things were going everywhere. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I tried a few other things. You can't actually mail lighters, I discovered. There was going to be a big lighter. Oh. You can't do an international uh, shipping of a big lighter, and condoms cost a lot of money to actually get printed. <laughs> oh, wow. So maybe, for, maybe for book two. Maybe for book two. We'll so, say, so tell me. I'm going to buy this, please, so I can get branded condoms. <laughs> so tell me, how, how do condoms? 
condoms or shouldn't I ask how do condoms feature in the book uh just going with the sort of backstage writer music industry sort of you know okay. hub, hub vibe um uh I believe there's safe sex in the book yes I <laughs> But yeah, it was, yeah. The, the 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 theme was just very broadly sort of just like the stuff that you'd get in a merch pack from a band, in the you know, back from a publicist day. back in the day. Yeah. yeah, just to make it a bit more interesting and you know generate interest, which clearly you know it does. So um, I, I believe I've I've got it downstairs. I don't have it upstairs. The um, the one page promo that tells you a bit about the book. It's talking about. Somebody travelling back through time and I think somebody's risen from the dead. You know, t- tell me a bit more about this. Um, so the story is about a guy called Ed Von Satan who is a pub rocker who gets zombified by a bunyip. Uh, <laughs> not a drop bear then. <laughs> not a, no drop bears in here, no. That's the, my, my cryptid's going to be, yeah, my favourite's the bunyip. Uh, it's such a, you know fantastic indigenous you know piece of folklore um and all my beta readers and all the rest are, are happy that uh, yeah you know, i seem to have like avoided being stepping over any cultural lines or anything i've sort of reinvented it for the story um and made it into sort of a uh colonizer murdering <laughs> uh weapon basically uh predator for the <laughs> predator for australia i guess uh so yeah ed von satan um goes on the road with his uh, a band called Babylon, who are a bunch of punk rock chicks from Adelaide, because they've been mistakenly called up to a gig for a organisation called the Arcadia Trust, who are a self-help cult, uh, who are looking to harness uh, the psychic energy of their audience uh, to raise a being called the World Blaster, whose earthly form is a regional politician called Tank Crusader Excalibur, Who's sort of like Barnaby Joyce meets oh. Barry McKenzie, maybe? Uh, and it's basically it's the sort of it's sort of the Shaggy Dog sort of scenario of like going through this crazy road trip uh, en route to the this event that they're unaware they're going to be participating in. Uh, the books I've actually taken the book and I'm going to release it as novellas over six months, so it'll start on Halloween. Uh, each one's about 130 pages, uh, just as an experiment because I think a lot of conversations I have these days with people writing longer form and stuff, they just don't think people read anymore. And I think, the ser- you know, sort of serialising it like Stephen King did with, like, The Green Mile or something is an interesting angle to take perhaps, and it's a lot of fun to sort of, like, you know, do the hype and make videos and do all that sort of gear into the mix as well. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like fun. I mean, I'm I personally into books. Yep. But then, you know, for me, reading's becoming harder and I'm listening more to audio books. Yes, yeah. Have you, have you thought about um, doing an, <clears throat> an audio book version? Well, there is There's a score being written by my friend John Shawk, who's a Seattle musician, uh, which will be triggered by QR codes uh, at certain points in the book so you can basically start to listen to, like, John's score as you hit different sections. Uh, I'd love to do an audio book, but uh, the production side of it will be something I'll look at once these are released, I think. (laughs) I think I might, yeah, look at that in between getting them out and then collecting it at some stage. I think your voice would be good for it because you you sound like you've got a good voice and also you've got just the right hint of (laughs) Australian that um, it wouldn't be too hard for foreigners to understand. Yeah, my my rounded vowels come from my Kiwi partner. Uh, I'm a dance, not dance now, but, yeah. (laughs) I got, yeah, I got, it's gleaned off a little bit, yeah, just taking the edge off the accent. Uh, But, yeah, I, I, I think with the right amount of time up my sleeve, yeah, producing it would be a lot of fun, yeah. Mm. Yep. <sighs> Which is, <laughs> I was hoping to handball it to someone else, but I think it's going to be me, yeah. <laughs> I did review an audio book a little while ago by an like an author read her own audio book which I actually found surprising because I think she won a literary prize, so I'm surprised oh. that somebody else didn't read her book for her. She was 
good, but she wasn't a professional and you could tell and it was a very serious kind of literary kind sure, of book. Yeah. So I'm, I'm surprised she didn't have somebody else. And then you have like Favel Parrot who's, um, she's, well, she's a mainlander. I met her when she um, was a kid in, a literally a high school kid in Tasmania. But anyway, these days she's um, working with dingoes on the mainland in between writing literary Right. Roles. And she had David Wenham read her book. Now, yeah, that yeah. was just amazing. Like, well, yes. I, I, if Jack Thompson was maybe 20 years younger, I'd probably <laughs> maybe earmark him. <laughs> oh, yes, because a 20-year younger Jack Thompson's kind of in the culture that you're kind yeah, of trying absolutely. to evoke. Yeah, I mean, I, Wake and Fright was uh, made uh, quite a few years before I was born, but, yeah, that's really... <laughs> <laughs> that is the situation out there <laughs> at that point. Um, Sorry, though... I I haven't. I'm not hugely into horror as a genre. It's is it oh, horror? I'm so- Sorry. That's oh, all right. Sorry. I mean, I'm not. I mean, my stuff references it, but it's not really horror. Um, but what, it's what more was... black comedy and yeah. uh, sort of delves through a lot of different genre. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this but, opens. But Wake up, and Fright isn't isn't that a horror story? With Jack Thompson well, it's, or it's social realism if you if you grew up in Broken Hill. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, Broken Hill friends. <laughs> Sorry, I I yes. have a bit of a more than a hint of rural upbringing myself, but yep. you know from Tasmania, not the, not the mainland. Yep. Not Broken Hill. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tasmania's got its own sort of like aesthetic when it comes to that sort of stuff, doesn't it? Yeah, I grew up in St. Allen's and St. Mary's. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah that with that too. kind of accent and, yep. yeah, and um, spent some time in New Norfolk, you know, where the um, mental institution used to be and right. that had a huge impact on the entire town, mm-hmm. really. Because like, there's the, what's it, is it called the... <sighs> It's the, the factory. I don't want to get it wrong because it's like a such a pivotal thing. But like a, I was commuting back and forth between Launceston and Hobart for work uh, a few years ago, and there's like, is it the female factory? No, no, or, that that was where they used to keep keep um, female convicts. Right. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so we've yes, had yes. a really quite wild. Um, history and you know that that has ah. grounded our culture ah. and most yeah. people know nothing about it mm. <laughs> no, yeah it's, it's, it's uh yeah definitely uh you know uh there's a it, the, the air hangs heavy <laughs> in, when you st- stop at those places um not i guess not as a tourist but just you know to sort of get a sense of what the history was that we don't get told about um at school or yes at least, I- yeah and there's the whole rewriting too. So anyway, before I get on to Port Arthur, <laughs> well, I was gonna... so more about this book. Now, you've got a really interesting backdrop there that is kind of trying to evoke your, or well, evoke themes in your story. And it's um, it's one of those photo backgrounds because you're in currently in a holiday home so do you want to tell me a bit about this story of this photo in your background well, I'll, I'll turn i'll turn the uh, background off later on and you can see the my little ponies that are behind me actually. <laughs> not <laughs> quite in the right lane no, no. I, was, I was going to do it i was tempted but then um yeah i took a look and i thought i better sort of stick to the brand uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um we have been we were displaced by the uh, floods in uh, February this year uh, and luckily, you know, very – we weren't affected that badly in the sense that, like, we got our things out and just had to leave um, and we were lucky enough that the insurance covered all that um, and we didn't have a traumatic time of, in that sense. But we ended up in New Zealand uh, at my partner's As you do. dad's place and <clears> – <throat> which happened to be empty uh, at the time because he's left and is planning to get out of there permanently. So we had somewhere to go, which is great. And it's also got this basement, um, which I'd film all my social media uh, book reads and things like that in. Uh, so I'd go down there with a couple of beers and uh, stick a camera on a ladder and 
work on my various releases for Instagram and Twitter. That and sounds yeah. fantastic <laughs> and, and heaps of fun. Well, it's, yeah, it's, um, you know, having come from that background of like film and TV uh, pr- production and advertising, like that stuff's just as much fun in some senses as writing. Uh, especially when you're sort of trying to juggle <clears throat> sort of being the primary carer for like a nearly four-year-old, sometimes just sort of delving into something you can do very quickly, like produce a 90-second video and then get that out there uh, is just all you can achieve. So, But, yeah, so that, that I do miss that basement and I took a lot of photos of it before we left for things like this. <laughs> so I had coverage and I could insert myself into them. <laughs> Yeah, that that sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to just ask um your four year old had a I won't say horrific, but had an incident with a upsetting, cat and ended up in, upsetting ish. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And ended up in hospital herself. Yes. Um <laughs> are you going to use this? kind of experience in uh, any future books? I have been thinking about that. Um there is a second trilogy that I've started working on and I'm sort of mapping it on the events of the last few years as a sort of rough guide to the plot because it's been a very turbulent time for everyone. But, yeah, we've done a lot of moving around and a lot of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of displacement and a lot of different things have sort of kicked off. So, yeah, this will probably make it in at some stage. Uh, not in a completely literal sense, but I'm sure there'll be a, a reference somewhere. Uh, now that, yeah, we're happy that, her vision's okay and <laughs> should have a back to daycare on Monday after a <laughs> pretty big week. After a week of watching My Little Pony. Well, yeah. I, well, the new ones with the manga eyes and everything are really, it's just, yeah, a lot to process. But we did get some Bluey play sets and things like that and we can cope with Bluey. <laughs> oh, Bluey's that's good. Great. Yeah. Yeah, Blue, Bluey's actually a bit of an international icon, I believe. Yes, uh, I saw a news story the other day that they actually, Disney actually censored the episode about farts. Uh, they didn't. They didn't run it. What? <laughs> they had to clear the censors. An episode of Bluey for for the farting episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I haven't watched it, but like, wow. I mean, that's I mean wild. yeah. <laughs> Oh, I understand that um, there was a Peppa Pig episode that was censored in Australia because it was talking about spiders and it was encouraging people not to be scared of spiders. And Australian censors said, yeah, no, we don't want children to be not scared of spiders and to die, thank you. So we'll, we'll censor yeah, that I mean, one. <laughs> middle, just don't annoy the spider. <laughs> yeah, leave it alone. Don't pick it up. The, yeah, you have to be scared of it. Just, uh, just yeah. let it go. <laughs> Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I confess that uh, my reaction when hearing about the Peppa Pig spider episode being censored was like, good. <laughs> when my son was really little, he was absolutely fearless. He was so interested in spiders. And he'd go and he'd pick up these little white-tailed spiders. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> and, thanks to my... And he firmly blames me for his arachnophobia because apparently he does have arachnophobia now. Well, but yeah, it's just, the ones to be I, phobic about, the white tail for sure. <laughs> I was just trying to stop him from getting bitten by a white tail spider and he wasn't listening. <laughs> International listeners, uh, if a white tail bites you, your flesh starts to necrotise and you potentially lose a limb. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes. They're not the <laughs> they're the ones you don't want to be bitten by. Well, you know, them yeah. and trapdoors and funnel oh, webs and, and Yeah. Red backs uh, and <laughs> Red backs. I did actually the I did a podcast recently which was two American authors asking me about all of Australia's awful thing <laughs> awful wildlife. Because they want to get out of there, but I think by the end of the podcast I'd convince them that they don't want to come here. <laughs> On the, on the other hand, we have the perfect setting for a horror story. Anything you want. We have flora, we have fauna, we have sea creatures. They'll all kill you. We have and if they don't. Pardon? Just the environment itself. Yeah, yeah. I was just going <laughs> to yeah. say the number of times we've heard stories, like it's been in the news, where these people have set out for a really long drive in the outback. Mm. 
and they haven't taken extra water and they haven't taken extra petrol and they haven't taken any of the, you know, normal common sense precautions and they end up dead. I wrote a short story about that in my first collection. (laughs) (laughs) Do tell. Uh, it was more, it was a sort of a very, it was like a flash fiction um, revenge thing where basically a service station attendant starts to hate on a, a Sydney based radio announcer that keeps coming through. Uh, so he fills his tank with uh, bleach because he knows he's about to head to the, he through the longest stretch on his journey so that the engine would seize and he'd, <laughs> yeah. That's one way to do it. Uh, yeah. uh, pro- probably a better way and a way of not getting caught would just be to not fill up the car. But, you know. There, there was a plot point in there somewhere. Um. <laughs> oh, also you get a metre, so he would yeah, have known. Yeah, exactly. some, yeah. But yeah. Bleach, yeah, bleach is, yeah, I'm not, not endorsing the technique, but, yeah, that will do it after about 200 kilometres. It'll destroy your engine, yeah. Oh, yeah, and the which also reminds me, for our international listeners, I've heard really wild stories about, you know, someone's going to visit Adelaide and their friend from, you know, an American or a, or a POM or somebody is going to visit Adelaide and a family member will say, oh, while you're there, can you just drop this off in Brisbane? <laughs> and Australians just go... Pow! Yes, it's, it's quite a big country. <laughs> quite a big <laughs> Actually reminds me, uh, one of the infl- inspirations for this, um, when I was a kid, do you remember the, the Knowles UFO story? The Nullarbor plane? Uh, vaguely. But they, they also had um, remnants of Skylab in their cafes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, highly, highly uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> reactive. Remember, radioactive. Yeah, I think I was nine or ten and I was like that really, you know, especially the 60 Minutes interview, which was sort of like, they all seemed like they, you know, smoked a few cones before they went on, and it, just just that sort of weird Australian like outback. Uh, you just the, just the bizarre nature of some of those things, like yeah. And as a kid, obviously growing up remotely, you drive long distances, and at that stage, you know, you drive through the night. I wouldn't drive through the night now because uh, the kangaroo situation is, you know, a lot. But, you know, I remember driving through the night, sleeping in the back of the station wagon with no seatbelt. <coughs> yeah. you know, and, you know, you'd see, you would see the Min Min lights and those sorts of things. And it was, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it is a, uh, I guess it's an optical illusion, but it's still pretty terrifying when you're <laughs> nine or ten, mm. thinking like I'm out in the middle of nowhere and my parents are actually driving me through the night <laughs> in the dark. What could happen? Yeah, a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. And, and you know, the kamikaze wildlife is just part of it. Yes, yeah. There's, it's usually emus, I find, that are more <coughs> insistent on having a, you know, of rushing the car. Oh, I, we've had problems with wombats. Like, really? Like w- one time we drove from Strawn to Hobart through the mountains, which was a really bad idea, and we did it at the end of the day. And, you know, we're Tasmanians, but... And we, we'd gone back to Tasmania for, for a visit, but we'd never had the money to, like, go and do the southwest stuff. Mm-hmm. So we were doing that, and then we, we drove to my father-in-law's in the middle of the night. wasn't supposed to take half as long, but it was misty, it was rainy, and there was kamikaze in my life. Yep, yep. <laughs> and that reminds so me of it. <laughs> the wombats. I, I mean, you hit a wombat, you might as well hit another truck. Yeah, a wombat will mess up the <laughs> the vehicle for sure. Yeah. I remember um, with a mate, uh, the, the the drive between Broken Hill and Mildura is maybe two and a half hours, three hours if you're taking it relatively sedately. And we <clears throat> were coming back uh, just after dusk because we dropped his wife off at the bus station because the transport situation out there is getting worse and worse, and you've got to you know, you, it's almost impossible unless unless you drive. So we left left Mildura and the road was basically lined with kangaroos on both sides. What's usually a two and a half hour drive was nearly eight (laughs) because of just the constantly, like you you could maybe get to 40 k's an hour. Like it was just a regiments of kangaroos for the entire nearly 300 kilometres, just all out. (laughs) 
It was really, it was like almost uncanny, you know, in a lot of senses. I've not seen it before. Yeah, it's so bizarre. We've, I mean, I've, I grew up in Tasmania, but going back in 2004 and doing that, that drive through the mountains, it was just, yeah, they were hurling themselves at the car sometimes. Oh. And, and we were going really slowly. And yeah, we took, I think it was supposed to take two or three hours and we took something like five or six, just really crawling yep. for yep. most of it. There's lots of driving in this book too. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a feature of just growing up in Australia, yeah. really. Yeah. You just, yeah, you, it's sort of second nature. And I find it funny now that, you know, we when we're in New Zealand, we'll have, oh, we've got to drive for two hours. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's, a, you know, <laughs> we're going to the north. Oh, yeah, it's a 300-kilometre drive. Yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> That's a, be, that's a shopping trip. You know, you could do. <laughs> I can do better than that. In Canberra, people <laughs> complain if they have to drive for more than 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you live north of the lake, when I say the lake, there are several lakes, but we're talking Lake Burley Griffin. Yep. If you live north of the lake, you don't go south of the lake. And if you live south of the lake, you don't go north of the lake. And we're like, well, you know, we spent seven years living in Melbourne, driving half an hour to go to, like, the best pub with the best beer garden. Yeah, yeah. Um, is just, like, that's fine. It's just what happens. Yeah. And people yeah, are I like, mean, you're going all the way up there? It's like, it's half an hour. <laughs> that north-south divide is always very... I, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Like, you know, Melbourne, obviously, the river is the big the, the delineator between the... Uh, I, I'm, I've lived in, I lived in St Kilda for about six months, but otherwise lived uh, in the north for the, major, the majority of the time I was there. In the north. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. Uh, Fitzroy and Brunswick mainly. Yeah, but, yeah, people re really get fixated on it. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I just... Yeah. Mind you, when I came from Tasmania, I, I heard stories about people commuting distances and back then it was like, you know, an hour drive was long. Um, I could not get my head around some people considering a trip from Hobart to Launceston as a day trip. <laughs> and, um, and then we're in Adelaide. And we drove down to Victor Harbour as a day trip. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. And we were in the the northeast, so it wasn't oh, like a one-and-a-half-hour drive. It was more like a two, two-and-a-bit-hour drive. It's like, yeah, that's a day trip. No problems. Yeah. We used to hold a Normanville down there uh, quite a bit when we were yeah. growing up. That's like, yes. That was like when I discovered second-hand bookshops <gasps> as a kid. <laughs> Oh. And it was a combination of comics and trying to catch up on Stephen King, uh, <laughs> <coughs> having read it at probably age nine or something ridiculous like that. Uh, speaking of being precocious, um, <clears throat> but yeah, it was that, that was the first place I just couldn't wait to go because they had secondhand bookshops and I could just yeah get the comics I wanted, get the <laughs> get the reading material, and slowly branch out to Clive Barker and <laughs> and, <laughs> and onwards. <laughs> He was hilarious. Yeah, I tried one of his recent books. Not so good anymore. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well. Yeah, the the shtick is sort of worn thin, but you know, fair enough. Um. Yeah, some sometimes I think um, we have only so much in us, mm. and yeah. sometimes I think we, the readers, grow and change. Yes, absolutely. The combination yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that. Yeah, definitely played better to a fifteen-year-old. Although they didn't get, I didn't get obviously a lot of the subtext at that point. Uh, took a bit longer to get there, but yeah. <laughs> I grew up with the goodies, and <laughs> it wasn't until I don't know, ten, twenty years ago, that I realised that that was all really, really political. It's like. Oh wow, that that completely changes everything. <laughs> yeah, pretty bullshy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not stuff. Yeah, at six thirty or whatever it was when the, the goodies were on, like that wasn't what you expected. As a oh, the goodies were on at six o'clock and Doctor Who six. was on at six thirty. Excuse okay. me. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, I was maybe my TV was slower because I was in the bush. <laughs> <laughs> now that was in the bush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, because. 
Yeah. Mm. Anyway, we, we're kind also of getting... Also, time difference. Six, yeah, half an hour di- <gasps> half an hour difference. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You've even got... I don't know if you can see yeah. that, but you can, you've can. you even got, like, the goodies font across the top <laughs> here. And um, so you've got lots of different... I've actually trimmed that one out in the final edition because oh. it might make an appearance later, but it's just... Yeah, it doesn't quite skew to the continuity. It was more of a just fun thing to put in, but I think I'll just... Yeah, I'll save that one. The album cover makes it. <laughs> so it's it's one of those things where you've had to like kill your darlings because the story is the most important thing. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't take myself too seriously. No. Um, yeah. I, I just I think that would have been confusing because like it reference it was a fun a thing I'd done for the an anthology I put together years ago that was a part of the genesis of this, uh, but I think it would have been confusing to sort of tangentially reference that stuff just as a throwaway. So it got the chop last night when I went to print. So George Lucas still references his first movie that I have watched and I can assure you it is absolutely... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely terrible. I want my <laughs> I want those hours of my life back. But you're not going to do the same thing. I'm not going to, no. I'm not saying that you're get first. away from self indulgence. Uh, yeah, I watched the uh, we we got the uh, Disney subscription for the, the new Predator movie, so I've been going through their content and watched the Industrial Light and Magic documentary. Oh, really? And yeah, poor George. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely. I mean, yeah, bound up in the a fairly complex range of delusions about what he's done at this stage. I think. <laughs> Oh, that's a shame. I think uh, a lot of a lot of empathy for the special effects artist Phil Tippett, who did yeah a lot of the um, stop stop motion gear because that, it's a devastating story for him as it sort of charts the course to Jurassic Park and onwards, and the, the CGI taking over. <clears throat> oh yeah. Um, but he did release a very I won't say, I won't say it's an easy watch but he released a thing called Mad God recently, which is a stop-motion film he made based on his dreams that's really quite an impressive achievement. Over 30 years he made this, so it's worth checking out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's always really sad to see when technology takes over. It's like, you know, the Muppets are just glorious creations and dinosaurs, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and dinosaurs was just such a fantastic TV show, like real family viewing but only because kids wouldn't get some of what they're talking about yeah. <laughs> like the euthanasia yeah. episode and um yeah and then and then we come along and we've got cartoons and cgi and i think they have their place but i'm sad to see the old skills die and, or or be shelved and gather dust yeah, I mean, a lot of this is inspired. Like, I talk a lot about exploitation on the segment with Justin Hamilton on his podcast. Um, Can you give me the the link to that, and I'll stick it in the post I'll with this podcast? I'll send it over later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but a lot of this, you know, is obviously heavily film inspired, and from that era of like when you just turn up and like blow something up, ram a car into like, <laughs> you know, if someone got hurt, you know, so be it. Uh, hopefully not, but. <laughs> We're gonna make a movie, uh, so yeah, and, and <clears throat> so yeah, there's that just that sense of you know the daring do and like the don't give a shit attitude. That yeah, I mean, talking about special effects, like it's sad to see that like it's it wiped out a whole bunch of very creative people, and then the art form inverted commas is slowly eroded to the stuff you see in Marvel movies today, where it's just you know churned out by a production line. Uh, and there's no passion or <laughs> drive behind it anymore. I think that's what makes what you do stand out from something like a franchise. I mean, a franchise is big business. It's it's paid work for a lot of people. Mm. But this is what this is a pr- passion project. Yes. And um, you're making me think of uh, like. Brina Kelly, who I interviewed a little while ago, and she managed to, in about six days, 
um, obviously it took a lot more planning, but in about six days she and a bunch of friends made a movie that she'd written. Right, yeah. And I love that movie. It's called The Fair. Um, I think it'll be a cult classic, but it's hard to find, mm-hmm. unfortunately, because she doesn't have the big dis- distribution companies behind her. This, these passion projects, they're really special and they bring out so much like I mean, you're you're um, combining so many different different things. Like it's a it's a real minestrone. Yes. Yeah, of, yeah. of ideas, but it's also about production value and creativity and absolutely yeah. and even the bling i mean <laughs> like bling. seriously and there's a i'm going to open up the pre-orders on the 14th of september and i've gotten my friend simon sherry who's a really great illustrator to do a limited edition cover for the first hundred copies that once they're gone they'll be gone uh simon has got some, yeah, he uh, worked with me at a place called Umbrella Entertainment and he did a whole bunch of great Blu-ray reimaginings for films like Razorback and uh, a whole bunch of Stuart Gordon and things like that and he's really bought it as well. So you can grab those and otherwise there will be the standard one that will come out when it actually does release. But, yeah, just – just yeah, and having talented mates and bringing them in. Um, I did anthologies with like 20 creators and that's – a lot of work <laughs> but having a couple of people earmarked just to be able to come through and like provide audio and you know alternative imagery and things like that i did all the graphic design in it and put it together and set up the all, all that sort of gear but yeah to have people sort of put that cherry on top is really exciting too mm-hmm. uh it's a lot of fun with these pre-orders are uh, you mailing overseas yep cool so uh i'm i'm actually not gonna i refuse to use amazon <laughs> cutting <laughs> cutting my nose spite my face all the rest so it's all going to be through my website uh, just uh, to, just to note to anybody listening to this podcast on the amazon platform i'm not a fan either but you know <laughs> just can't do it just can't <laughs> do it and i know they own everything and you know i sort of made a compromise and I, I've got a good reads profile where you can review it and all the rest. And I know Amazon, you, when you see that little bloody link, the Amazon UPI go through, it's like, ah, <coughs> you bastard. It's like, <laughs> I will go out of my way to source something somewhere that isn't Amazon. Absolutely. Uh, and well, and yeah. when I say that my podcast is on the Amazon platform, it's also on like Everything. three dozen other platforms. So, yeah. you know. But in this case, I was like, I think I can do it through the site. Um, I've been sort of budgeting and putting it all together and, yeah, I actually don't really give a shit, Jeff. <laughs> this is Yay! Uh, you, you'd prefer people be allowed to go to the toilet when they need to and not have to wear nappies? Uh, well, it's crazy, I know. Uh, I've mm. seen the patent for some of that stuff. Um, <laughs> my partner's a very talented uh, art curator and she just did a show about uh, a lot of uh, those practices and... Yeah, the more you go down the rabbit hole, it's just, you know, you, you, you can't opt out of existence in 2022, but, like, you know, you're pretty much screwed on every front. So I guess making a stand somewhere <laughs> gives you at least a sense of some sort of agency. Yes, I think it's uh. really important. And, I mean, you know what they say, for um, evil to prosper, good people do nothing. Yeah. So, yeah, so you know. Boycott where you can. Um, Absolutely. Avoid the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I stopped, yeah, completely using the pl- ordering from them maybe seven or eight years ago. <laughs> yeah. Do what you got to do. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm, in, I'm really fortunate because I'm in a situation where I don't mind spending a few extra bucks to get it from somewhere else. Absolutely, yeah. But some people aren't in that situation and I get that too. Yeah, and I mean, oh, you know, releasing it digitally, um, you know, do it to do an ebook and go on any of those platforms. You're automatically uh, dictated to by what Amazon's conception of what a proper ebook is too. <laughs> so you've got to tick all their boxes, and it's like, oh, your novel can't have images, <laughs> or you know, you can't do be ambitious with graphic design because we want to just reflow your text and you know mess with it. So a PDF at the end of the day. It's just as viable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, for most people it would be. 
Yeah, or you know, a you know, as long as it works on a reader, um, that's the sort of compromise to make, I guess. Mm. But it will be out in digital as well, obviously. Um, but awesome. the limited the limited edition cover won't go on as digital. And yeah, once I've sold out of those, they're just going to be gone. So that's the. But that's that's, that's all the about the, the collector's item yes. artifact. That's you know, the like, carrot. And for, I'll, I'll sign it. Even <laughs> not that that really means much. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I've, I've got. <laughs> we'll see um, what happens. <laughs> I have. I personally have a few shelves full of books that are autographed, and yeah. you know they're special books because you know yeah, it does mean something. Yeah. And yeah, and when when I die, people can fight over the autographed copies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Thank you okay. very much for talking to me today. A lot of fun. Thank you. And um, uh, do you want to give us give us the um, the links to? Uh, yeah, uh, my website is pasttheamel.com. Uh, socials are pass uh, the amel too, um, and the book will be up at pre. Will you be able to pre order the book at pasttheamel.com forward slash shop in just under two weeks? Okay, now, AML is spelled A-M-Y-L. It is, is, yeah. is there any um, Is there any significance? Like, is that an acronym <laughs> for something? Uh, no, it's a uh, – what's the what's the PG version of that? Uh, it's an you inhalant. don't have to be PG. Okay, I mean, well, I think it's people – It's an inhalant that you get from a sex shop uh, to help relax your um, glands. Dear. And also uh, leather cleaner. <laughs> oh, you can clean your vinyl with it too. Uh, but it was, yeah, it's a reference uh, to like living very day to day rock and roll uh, in the mid 2000s in Fitzroy and going to a lot of gay bars and doing a lot of uh, mis, you know, just getting up to hijinks with my gay mates, my queer mates <laughs> over an <laughs> extended period of time. And yeah, the the phrase was pass the ammo at a certain point of the night uh, and that became the brand okay fair enough fair <laughs> enough when, when i went you know, when i was Everyone's when i was learning. doing my degrees um i actually <laughs> had to actually would you believe that sexuality is actually a subject at university and um the most memorable class i had i had a gay tutor and we had to go to a sex shop and buy stuff and we had to come back and have a show and tell. <laughs> was, that in, was that in Tassie or was it? No, 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 no this way. this was in Adelaide. I've moved around a bit. I was going to say, yeah, because Tassie only legalised it, you know, fairly recently, didn't it, in the scheme of things? In the I 80s maybe? I don't maybe? know. I remember legal or... Well, the, the legislation to stop homosexuality being a crime was being talked about in the 80s. I don't know when it actually mm. happened. Um, yeah, but no, this this was in Adelaide in the noughties. Yep. In the noughties, right. Mm. I, was in Adelaide, wow. I was in Adelaide in the noughties too. Yeah, small yeah, world. Living in Glenelg. <laughs> I was living in Parra Hills. All right, yep. Yeah, I don't know how... So you're was... living in the cool end of town. <laughs> well... I don't know how we pulled it off because it was a, like a block from the beach and it was like 150 bucks a week. <laughs> it was bizarre. Wow. That's awesome. I guess that's 20 years ago, but, yeah, it wouldn't happen now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Magic Mountain's gone. They've got yeah. towers in, in its place and I'm waiting for them to fall over because, you know, they're built on sand and that's before <laughs> you start factoring in the sea level change. And I'm actually heading to Adelaide in two weeks for Justin's birthday. So we can ha say happy 50th to Justin as well. And hopefully he hears this. Uh, happy 50th, happy Justin. 50th. <laughs> go and have drinks in, in Glenelg and it's go and walk along Rundle, the beach for down, me. Rundle Street, I think. Oh, Rundle Street. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a thing. And a podcast recording, I think, to go with it. So, yeah. Happy birthday, Justin. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. And Thanks, listeners, yeah. thank you for, for bearing with us. So everybody stay safe and uh, wear a mask and wash your hands. and um, Be sensible, please. Yes, we, we want you back and we want you to have fun and yeah. be healthy. So have a, have a good one. And um, I have no idea who I'll be interviewing next, so watch this space. Bye. Bye.